then you will answer. Yeah. I think that's better. So we will have like, because we have three speakers. So maybe after the speakers present, yeah. if someone want to ask, then through the chat, you can read it for us. It's also okay. Okay, okay. So after mm -hmm. the, all three speakers finish, yeah? Yeah. And we have time until 10 a.m., right? Yeah. 10.30, okay. yeah. Oh, 10.30? 10, 10 all right, all right. Okay. So um, I think because we are also eager to hear about uh, vaccine development for SARS-CoV-2. So I think I will uh, open the sessions. So, uh, well, or to welcome uh, the team from the Merck Chemical Life Science Indonesia, Mr. Asanga Halangoda, Ibu Ilma Equilibrina, and Ibu Sri Hayuni. Uh, welcome to this webinar uh, in I3L. And also, I would like to thank uh, the organizer, yeah, Ibu Wirda, and uh, uh, and the team to organize this webinar. Um, so before I start, I would like to um, read a few uh, words about the CV of Mr. Asanga Halangoda. So Mr. Asanga Halangoda is the head of research business at Merck Chemical Life Science Indonesia. He has been working in Merck Millipore for over nine years. Uh, he has been appointed as the director of Merck Life Science, which focuses on the strategy and implementation in Philippines. And he was also a director of Bioscience Asia Pacific for over then three years in Victoria, Australia. Uh, and now he is here in Indonesia. So it is a very privilege for us to have you, Mr. Asanga, and also the team, Ibu Ilma and Ibu Sri Hayuni. And um, with that, I would like to uh, welcome uh, the MAP team, Mr. Asanga. Uh, I don't know uh, what is the sequence, uh, yeah, but the MAP team to present uh, the topic about um, vaccine development for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Mr. Asanga, we hear some uh, noises, yeah. a little bit of noises, not very clear. Oh, in, yeah. your, your voice is breaking apart, sir. I can barely hear you. Let me okay. Okay. Uh, how about now? Can you see me? Yes, it is much, much better. Yep, okay. It's much, much better now. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so uh, thank you. Selamat pagi, someone, yeah? Thank you to um, I3L for inviting us for um, this topic, discussion. Uh, and it's an honor for us to be part of um, uh, this talk and share some information with you. So, um, I know we were, the request was to talk a little bit about vaccines, but we felt that because that's um, a small part right now of the overall um, COVID situation, we wanted to address um, overall virology with you, talking about viral pathology, vaccines, and therapeutics. Uh, we go into a little bit about testing and monitoring, and then also maybe something that would be interesting to the students uh, viral research uh, so hopefully it can stimulate you to do something uh, in your labs as well uh, this is my team uh, that we'll be presenting today uh, as we go along if you have any questions uh, please you can write it in the chat or, or raise your hand my apologies this is the first time we are using zoom so uh, 
Um, if there is some questions, then hopefully the moderator, uh, you can pause us at any time to, to ask any pertinent questions, okay? Okay, so uh, before we go into details uh, about COVID in particular, I thought I'll talk a little bit about um, viruses, as many of you know. Uh, viruses are infections agents. And unlike any other living organisms that are unicellular, viruses cannot replicate by themselves. And this is a unique uh, characteristic of the virus. Um, it always needs a host to able to replicate itself. Um, we are constantly bombarded with multiple viruses and have been living with viruses for centuries. Um, as you can see here, these are some of the common viruses that are plaguing humans. Um, they are based on different families. Uh, so you can see here common viruses like hepatitis, uh, viruses that cause skin diseases, including measles and rubella that we have vaccinations for, and, um, STDs, and then um, coming down to the coronaviruses, uh, these are viruses that cause respiratory problems in the lung, similar with uh, influenza virus A and B uh, that cause the common cold. So in general, we are constantly, as mammals, bombarded uh, with viruses and we are fighting viruses all the time. Virus exists in the population and normally the viruses are within a certain species. But in some cases, as you can see here, due to close proximity of humans with wildlife and also with farm animals, the virus is sometimes able to cross over to different species to enable it to replicate. And so this is kind of a evolutionary tactic of the virus to be able to propagate itself. Uh, there's viruses also seen in fish, in addition to the animals that I have up here. And also, there are viruses that impact plant life as well. And finally, here on the bottom left side, you can see this is uh, viruses that are infiltrating a bacteria. And in many cases, unlike mammals, bacteria is also able to build an immune response against virus. If you may know that recently there's a technology scientists are using called CRISPR to cut DNA and, and make sure that the DNA is not. And that actually is coming from bacteria, where bacteria has a Cas9 protein that mounts a immune response against viral attacks. Okay. I'm sure you have uh, seen a lot of this over in the internet and the news, and this is why most of us are doing social distancing and wearing a mask, is to limit the virus transmission. So viruses are normally spread through what we call here droplets, when somebody is coughing or speaking or um, sneezing in certain cases. And based on the virus, you can see that the distance the virus can travel within those droplets change. And this also has an impact uh, on the environment. For example, in uh, Western countries where it's cool, the virus is able to spread and last longer on surfaces. But in tropical countries, warmer countries like Indonesia, the spreading of the virus as well as uh, the virus being able to stay viable outside in the environment is a lot shorter. <clears throat> So when we look at uh, transmission of virus, for example, like COVID, it can transfer from person to person from droplets. There are also viruses that are transmitted between people and then between the mom and uh, the baby, for example, like Zika virus that causes microcephaly. And there are also vector-borne viruses like um, dengue, etc., that we get from mosquitoes and chicken good. Yeah. The virus cannot transmit from person to person, but a mosquito will transmit from one person to another. 
We are also exposed to viruses from meat consumption, uh, and that's how this COVID-19 started, as well as uh, the COVID virus that was responsible for SARS in 20, 2002. You can also get a virus from a blood transfusion. Um, in this case, things like hepatitis, HIV. Virus also transmits via stool samples. And currently, they're also finding that the COVID-19 is in wastewater coming from stool. And finally, here, you can see within plants, there's also vectors like bugs that can transmit the virus from one plant to another. <coughs> so viruses have all efficiently to use all these different methods to be able to survive and go from one host to another. Now, if we come down to the current coronavirus, um, there are three different really big areas we want to discuss. The coronavirus is called Corona because of this halo, it looks like a crown. The, the red items you see right here are called spike proteins that are glued to the blue capsid protein here. And this forms the major body of the virus. We'll talk a little bit about COVID-19 and specifically SARS-CoV-2. We'll discuss a little bit how we are testing for the virus infection right now. Then we'll go into detail about the spreading of the virus and changing So, COVID is a disease that we have that is caused by this SARS-CoV-2, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome virus. Um, <clears throat> this can be also seen in other diseases, like for example, we get AIDS from the HIV virus. And then if you remember in 2002, 2003, we had an outbreak of SARS, which was also a coronavirus that was called SARS-CoV-1 virus and causing the disease uh, SARS. Bluetooth connected. Um, and as I mentioned before, viruses are completely dependent on hosts for replication, unfortunately for us. And that you can see here on the right side in the schematic where Normally, we are applying to one of the receptors on a cell. So this is a cell, you can imagine. And as it binds to the receptor of the cell, it is then taken into the cellular body. It will use the mechanism in our bodies that we have, recruiting proteins, amino acids, etc., to unravel its genome and then start to replicate itself. And after replicating itself, you can see here, the one virus enters the body. And then three viruses are exiting the cell body to start infecting other cells. And this is how we become sick. So when the cells start to become sick, uh, and in some cases they go to apoptosis and the virus is spreading in our body, we will mount an immune response and start getting fever at this point. One of the interesting things about this virus is uh, that it is RNA-based, and many viruses in this family are, which make it a little difficult um, to also tag down, especially with things like drugs or with um, vaccines, for example, because the DNA that is normally used for replication has a proofreading enzyme. So when the DNA replicates itself, you know it doesn't make many mutations because mutations cause disease. So as an evolutionary mechanism, DNA will replicate itself with not changing too much. But the replication enzyme for RNA does not have the same proofreading enzymes. So as the virus is replicating itself, it can cause many mutations, which means the virus that's going in here could be genetically different from the virus that's coming out here. And this makes it very difficult for us to also target these viruses to attack them because they keep evolving and changing. Okay. So luckily for us now, due to digital technology and uh, open science globally, we have been able to understand um, the COVID genome. It was first sequenced in Wuhan and then published on this German um, website called GISA, 
where globally all the scientists are publishing the same different countries. So back again to this graph, uh, uh, using this uh, immune response detection uh, by specific antibodies. Now uh, people using it for detection of SARS-CoV-2, but this is only can be used for detecting the past infection, not the current infection. If it's the current infection, then we need to detect directly the virus or part of the virus uh, that I will uh, discuss uh, today. Uh, so this is usually now the method uh, that uh, the biomarkers that are detected is by the viral nucleic acid, the DNA or the RNA. And also the second method now also occurring is the antigen test, which is like the part of the virus can be like a spike protein or a nucleic acid protein and it can be used in the antigen test uh, that uh, also detected in the membrane and can be used as a point of care. So for the RT-PCR, I just want to explain a bit of the flow test that now happening in the country. So also maybe give to you also the awareness if we have for for example, the uh, maybe you want to test or your family want to test. So the usually the first step is specimen collection and then transporting to the central lab, RNA extraction and RT-PCR. That's why the RT-PCR, even though this now is a gold standard, but still it needs process and time to be uh, when, when we want to get the result. So for the sample collection, uh, the main component also the viral transport media so this is to preserve or maintain the integrity of the specimen, the virus itself. And then it also consists of media, usually serum, buffer, antibiotic, uh, and antimicotic to preserve it. And then usually it will be stored and shipped in the four degrees. So this is just the sample collection based on the CDC guideline. So usually the main uh, sample that we will get is from the nasopharynx, which is the most uh, sample with the most coronavirus. So for nasopharynx, you just put it in the nose like this and then put it in the VTM and then the VTM will be sent. Actually, this is not a suitable picture because you, you have to wear the PPE to uh, sample it. And then uh, after that, it will bring to the central lab and then the RNA will be extracted and then it will be processed through the reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, where the first step, of course, the RNA will be trans reverse transcriptase into the cDNA and then it will be amplified by real-time PCR for the quantification and the detection using the positive control and the negative control to detect the SARS-CoV-2. But now, uh, Seeing that RT-PCR takes a quite long time to detect the SARS-CoV-2, they uh, now start developing uh, new methods. For example, like the uh, LAMP uh, method where you use uh, extracted viral RNA and then using the same control like in the RT-PCR, then using the CRISPR and Cas9 to target specific DNA, uh, uh, combined with the LAMP method, and then uh, also using the lateral flow visual readout, you can detect the positive and negative of the SARS-CoV-2. So this, you, using this method, you don't need a different temperature. You just need one temperature for incubation for LAMP method, and it will be more convenient. Uh, you can do it faster uh, uh, around the patient. So now uh, this is the SARS-CoV-2 workflow comparison. As we can see now, it's been developing uh, and already actually commercialized using the DetectTR, Sherlock, and we can see the comparison with QRT-PCR, which take much longer time compared to this uh, new method. <coughs> yeah, uh, from me, uh, that's it. Maybe we can go back now to Asanga's talk again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ilma. Are there any questions before I start again? Doesn't seem nothing in the chat right now. Okay.
Okay, so that's, um, I'm sorry, can somebody let me know if you can see and hear clearly? Yes, it's clear. Okay, so based on uh, what's going on right now, when we look at the, the epidemiology or the pathology of uh, the disease, uh, we are starting to see a pattern. And uh, this is uh, data that was published uh, in March, as you can see here. Uh, we observed globally that more men are dying of COVID-19 than women. So there's a huge difference between uh, gender bias, uh, and they are still a little unclear as to what is the true reason behind it, but there are some assumptions. Uh, number one is that um, most of the genes that are involved in our immune system or immunology are on the X chromosome, and uh, they feel that because women have two X chromosomes versus males have an XY, that women essentially could have a double uh, dose of um, the um, immunity against COVID. Um, secondly, uh, they also look at the hygiene levels in terms of washing hands, following rules, and um, wearing a mask, etc. And uh, seems like in general that women are uh, a bit more hygienic uh, than men. Sorry, guys, including me, to say this. But uh, these are some of the observations that were coming out in this paper. So right now, for the COVID uh, pathology at least, there's a clear discrimination between the, the deaths uh, between male and female. There's also a clear di uh, uh, difference between age. So you can see this is some early data published uh, by researchers in China. There's a huge increase in deaths as you as people get older so starting around 50 plus years of age there's an exponential increase in the risk of dying if you get covid virus infection and then <clears throat> during uh, the analysis of the people over here and and the, the men what they found in common was that a lot of these people had some underlying disease to begin with uh, they had a prevalence of metabolic syndrome relating to things like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, uh, and also people who had chronic respiratory diseases like asthma or lung cancer are more susceptible to dying from COVID-19. So if you are a male, you have underlying metabolic syndrome problems, and you are in this age range, um, you are definitely at high risk for being infected fatally from COVID-19 and need to take extra care, including uh, for people who have family members who are in this category as well. So some important factors to consider during um, the pathogenesis of COVID is, we want to look at how viruses like um, SARS or coronavirus enter human populations because they are mainly uh, originally circulating within animal populations. We will take a look at how the car circulates inside uh, the human uh, population. And then we can take a look at uh, what we expect in terms of herd immunity based on some data and relationships we have from other human viruses that we have seen before. Or if this virus is going to stay a longer time in the population and how we can coexist with the virus. So when we look at human pandemics, all human pandemics are caused by, by viruses that are jumping from uh, one animal, in this case it's the bat, to human populations. So going back to uh, 1918 when we had the first large recorded pandemic called the Spanish flu uh, which also was a virus that jumped from animal population to human population to the current pandemic that we are struggling with now COVID-19 the origin of the pandemic is actually coming from animals 
So within the animal, for example, the current coronavirus has been traced to bat and pangolin uh, as a, a cross species transmission. You see many circulating coronaviruses in the bats. However, there's a very low fatality rate because the bat itself has good immunity against the virus. Kind of like how we have immunity against the common cold. This is the human respiratory coronavirus, the common cold that we see all the time during flu season, for example, in colder countries. It's transmitted within the human population. There are some fatalities, but the fatality rates are low. Now the issue comes is when we have what we call a spillover, where the virus, in some cases due to its changing or adaptation, is able to move from one species to another. And here, the new species does not have an immune response to the virus because the virus is not in the population, it's a foreign body, and then it causes fatalities. For example, uh, if you remember not too long ago, 2012, there was a Middle Eastern virus known as MERS that was uh, transmitted to human from camel. And we saw a very high fatality rate of 30-40%. However, the virus was only doing a spillover from the animal to the human, but not, within, not able to adapt and transmit within the human population. So when a virus is able to jump from one species to another, we call that uh, process zoonosis. Now the danger happens is when the virus is able to number one spill over, like you see here, but also go through certain genetic and biological modifications where it's able to now transmit within the new species as well. And then you have a sustained human to human transmission like we see with the, the current COVID-19, which ends up resulting in a pandemic. There have been other pandemics before, so you can see like, for example, in 2002-2003, there was another outbreak of coronavirus, again starting in, in a wet market uh, where animal transmission over to human, and they had quite a high fatality case around 10%. So that virus uh, did not spread globally like it, it's doing with the current one, because the people who got sick got sick very rapidly and fast and passed away. So they were not had time to transmit to other people. The current coronavirus, when we look at the rates right now, the fatality rate is about one to 3%, depending on the country and the testing level. Some countries it's a bit higher, like Indonesia, around 10%, but we feel that's because currently the testing rates are still not optimal here. <clears throat> the danger when the fatality rate is low is that a person who is sick or asymptomatic can go around thinking that they are not uh, infected, but then they end up infecting other people who could potentially uh, get really sick. So normally this is how the virus would enter, uh, through what we found out to be a receptor combined with this S protein. And then it goes through the replication like uh, Inman mentioned before, and you get new viruses exiting the cell. So I want to focus a little bit here on this ACE protein virus <clears throat> um, combination because this ACE protein, ACE2, is seen in many mammalian species, and this is what the virus uses to cross over from species to species. So you can see here, the bat S2 protein is now able to bind with the virus spike protein, and therefore it will enter and um, sustain itself within the bat population. <coughs> this is more like a, a lock and a key mechanism that it uses to enter the cell. When the spillover happens, what we see is that actually this spike protein in the bat virus has now evolved through a genetic mutation to be able to match with the human S2 receptor, which is, you can see here, the lock is a little bit different from the bat S2 receptor. And now 
the spillover is able to happen into a new species due to this mutation. And it's able to be sustained in the new species after undergoing various evolutionary and biological processes. And this is how the virus now adapts in the new species. If you look at a crystallography chart of, of uh, COVID, this was published in 2012 after the first uh, COVID. This is what the spike protein looks like when it's binding to the AS2 protein. So in terms of our immunity and achieving home, her, herd immunity, uh, it's still a little too early to find out if there is herd immunity uh, from this particular virus. But we can get some ideas from viruses that we've been living with for a long time. Smallpox, which was a pandemic, is no longer an issue because we have um, anti-smallpox vaccines for it. Same with measles and polio and MMR. But you can see in cases that we saw last year where certain communities were refusing to get the MMR vaccine, we saw a huge increase in uh, these deadly diseases uh, with many children dying in, in, in certain examples. There are also diseases like rabies where we don't have herd immunity for, but there's no human to human transmission. And if you get treated as soon as you're bitten by uh, an animal that has rabies, you're able to get an anti-rabies vaccine that will uh, ensure your protection. There are examples where we can also use antibodies from uh, sick patients already. For example, in Africa, where Ebola, a very um, virulent uh, disease, uh, is able to get uh, antibody protection from extracting the serum plasma from patients that have the disease and then establishing, <coughs> sorry, giving that uh, serum plasma to the Ebola patients. Uh, they have seen that it's able to give them some form of protection. And then again, um, as I mentioned before, in terms of uh, the common cold, human respiratory viruses that used to cause a lot of deaths before, uh, H1N1, for example, uh, we are now learning to live with those viruses because there are herd immunity. And hopefully, uh, as you know, many companies and people, uh, including Merck, are collaborating and working together rapidly to try and develop a vaccine for this. But unfortunately, the challenge with vaccines are they take time to be, to be safe and to work properly. And because this is an RNA virus, uh, it's also a little bit challenging because it's a moving target. As you know, we still don't have a proper vaccine for HIV, although we've been living with it for 30, 40 years. So now to talk a little bit about uh, what Merck is doing related to this. Um, we are working in the country with companies and the government that are doing diagnostics, providing these kind of reagents. We've also done some uh, VTM sample preparation and manufacturing uh, where we collaborated with I3L. There are a lot of currently available antiviral drugs that are being repurposed for um, trials with the COVID-19 patients. And this is quite promising because these antivirals uh, work in blocking the virus from entering your cell. For example, you can use an antiviral to block the S2 protein, therefore inhibiting the spike from uh, combining with the S2 and uh, entering your cells. As you know, right now, uh, there's a very promising drug from Gilead, as well as some um, uh, steroids that are being uh, going on with trials. Um, the main area that we are also working on in Indonesia is with uh, vaccine development, uh, which is normally done in cell culture. And to give you more details on this, I'm going to pass the talk over to Sri Hayuni right now. Uh, Sri, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Asanga. Uh, can you hear me, hear me, everyone? Yeah, I guess so. All right. All right, so, uh, so thank you for the chance. Now I'm going to share my screen.
Do you see my screen now? Yes. All right. Now, um, first of all, let me introduce myself. So I am Sriha Yuvi, and I am one of the field application specialists in uh, Merck Indonesia. Now, um, within this talk, I'm going to talk about a little bit about vaccines development. So there are four main things that I would like to discuss today. The first one is the science of the vaccine. So we know what is the history of the vaccine and how does the vaccine uh, work to our body. And also, um, because we, uh, there are so many developments nowadays, so there are many types of vaccines. So I can say some traditional method using the virus and some modern methods. I'll discuss a little bit about uh, these uh, vaccine types later on in my slides. And also the third one, I would like give some updates on SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. And the last one, uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit about how the vaccines uh, actually manufa manufactured. Okay, now uh, the first slide, um, it's about the history of the vaccination. So as we know, vaccination is uh, uh, present in the world quite a bit of time. So it started on uh, 1776. And the first um, scientist is Edward Jenner. And uh, this, this vaccine actually for cowpox and what uh, a Jenner do is injected uh, the pus of the cowpox lesions from the eight-year-old boy, and then um, suddenly, when it's injected to the um, uh, to the boy, the boy is survived. So uh, this is basically coming from the idea of the vaccines. So uh, the the virus or the antigens coming from the uh, from the other uh, source, and then. Um, injected it to the, the patients and it works. Now, uh, the benefit of vaccines, um, as we know that there are many types of vaccines that have been licensed all over the world. And you see that before the vaccinations, um, far, varicella is, has uh, four, four, four million cases happen around the world. And by the vaccination, Today, uh, on 89% uh, per, of the case is uh, Geminis. Also, what we see in here, diphtheria is one of the um, common vaccines and it's worked really well. 0% uh, uh, incident in the US and, and many types of the vaccine that can save the human life. Now, uh, vaccines uh, has been spread uh, in 70, 73 countries around the world and have uh, actually uh, have saved six million life uh, since two thousand ninety uh, since 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 two thousands. Um, now let's see actually uh, how does the vaccine works. So because we are talking about uh, SARS CoV two infections. So uh, Asanga and Bailma also show you how this uh, SARS-CoV-2 infected the human body. Uh, so this is the, the virus. And as you know, the virus has the S protein, or we call as a spike protein. This uh, protein structure actually uh, used like a key mechanism. So this virus, when you uh, when need when it needs to enter to our body, it needs some specific keys. And the keys for this SARS-CoV-2 virus is the S protein. Now, as the key, you need a lock. Now, the lock or the lock which um, properly, the lock which properly uh, suitable for this S protein in our body is actually the cell uh, which has ACE2 receptor. Now, if this uh, virus as protein goes to the ACE2 receptor and uh, match it, then the virus infected our body. But don't worry, actually, if you got infected by the virus, every type of the virus, you have the immune response. So what is immune response? Is the ability to detect the foreign invader, which in this case could be virus or bacteria. And then our body respond it by creating the antibodies. 
Now, as you seen um, in the picture here, uh, you have to see that this is the structure of the coronavirus. So, as I mentioned, spike protein is the key. And besides spike protein, actually there is M protein as well. And there is the genome of the RNA. Now, spike protein, the key, entering the uh, S2 receptor, the lock in our body. And then they're going to release the RNA. And then uh, this RNA will be integrated to the um, human body cells and then uh, it conduct or in uh, const uh, on or command our uh, uh, cells to release the other virus so this is how this mechanism now this immune response of, of first will be um, um, will be responded by the SPSC or antigen presenting cell and then this uh, APC will uh, go for the help for T helper cell, B cell, and also cytotoxic T cell. Now B cell will produce the antibody and cytotoxic T cell will destroy the infected cell. Now when uh, to the time until the antibody present in your body, it takes quite a bit of time. So it's like maybe one week. So when you got infected and then uh, one week later, then the body will um, detect the antibody so all of this process if the virus go to our body in a quite higher higher amount then it could be lethal so what vaccine do is actually mimicking the disease agent so this is the disease agent and then um, this vaccine try to stimulate the immune system so that this antibody uh, or this uh, cytotoxic T cell could be uh, present earlier, so it's it won't be little. This antibody and this uh, cytotoxic cell present earlier, and then uh, it uh, could help you, um, uh, could help you to um, to cure you if the if the uh, 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 bacteria or if the pathogen infected your body. Now. Um, one of the most important thing also like B cell and cytotoxic T cell have this uh, uh, what is it uh, memory memory response. So once the cell is coming to the body and then our body will recognize it. So that's the vaccine's uh, work actually. So we giving them some disease uh, agents and then um, it uh, the immune response will record it in our body. Now. Uh, there are several types of disease agent that been used for vaccines. As you seen uh, in this picture, there are uh, seven types of the vaccines, and we start uh, with the traditional one by uh, putting uh, uh, the whole virus as a disease agents. Now, the whole pathogen or virus need to be inactivated or life attenuated. Uh, before coming to the body. So uh, for the wall in, in, in inactivated, you need to heat kill it or uh, chemically denaturate it by the formaldehyde. The example of this um, pathogen um, whole inactivated virus, uh, which has which been licensed now, is polio and rabies. Also, there is life attenuated uh, weakened virus. So uh, we weaken the virus by doing some serial passage or uh, by manipulating the growth conditions until the virus is being mutated and have less um, uh, immune immunogenicity. And the example of this virus is uh, MMR, uh, chicken pox and uh, uh, sorry, chickenpox or varicella. Now, in terms of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, de vaccine development, uh, also there is some group developing it. Uh, it's uh, coming from uh, New York, uh, working together with the Serum Institute uh, of India. So now, however, this um, whole pathogen vaccine have some disadvantages. For instance, um, it's uh, unstable. So by uh, biochemically or um, 
and in fact inactivated this virus, sometimes uh, the virulency will get it back. So for instance, uh, in case of polio virus, the virulency is coming back and instead of curing uh, the, the instead of curing the patient, uh, this polio virus infecting them like the real case of polio. Also, um, there are some contam contamination problem. In terms of contaminations, uh, before uh, the the vaccine manufactured by the egg, so sometimes egg is not really uh, hygiene, so there is uh, some contamination on it. And for the heat kill, for the life, uh, for the whole inactivated uh, using the heat kill, sometimes it's just not very um, strong, so that uh, so the the virus is very um, very weak, uh, and uh, the vaccine simply doesn't work. So this is some of the advantages of the um, traditional whole pathogen uh, vaccines. Now let's go with the second phase. The second uh, phase is the antigen, the, the vaccine who use the antigen. So antigen is actually the virus identity. So uh, when you see the structure of SARS-CoV-2, there is some fragments like the um, the uh, M protein or spike protein. Now they use it uh, to the vaccines. So what they do is this fragment uh, is, um, I can't sorry, yeah. Oh, sorry. So what they do is they uh, create these types of fragments like spike protein or M protein and then uh, uh, inject it to the human, the human cells and this can produce the vaccines. So for these antigen types besides the protein, there is also some new technology, what we call it as the virus-like particle. So virus-like particle is like... Um, the empty envelope of it and then they inject it to the uh, human body and then uh, our human body respond it uh, just like the real virus. Also there is some syn uh, synthetic peptide. So for synthetic peptide uh, the example is for, uh, as you can see here there is the uh, streptococcus and streptococcus have this M protein. What they do is they uh, uh, synthetically um, uh, create this M protein and uh, inject, inject it as the main component of the vaccines. Uh, however, uh, if we just if we just take this small fragment to our vaccines, uh, sometimes it's just less immunogenicity, uh, immuno, uh, it's low immunogenicity, immunogenicity. So what you need to do is you need to put some adjuvants and sometimes like jellyfish like liposome or sometimes you need to put it in the multiple dose. So this is, uh, this is the challenges uh, for doing um, antigen-based vaccines. Now in Indonesia for COVID-19, what I heard is uh, Biopharma working with the Eggman and they are trying to do some recombinant subunit vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. Now uh, the last part of the vaccine technology is using the genome of the virus. Now there are two types of um, virus who uh, vaccine who use the genome of the virus there is the um, recombinant viral factor recombinant bacterial factor so they need the factor or they can inject it uh, mrna or the uh, mrna or dna, uh, DNA. now in terms of the genetic uh, instructor or DNA or mRNA, mRNA, mRNA vaccine, this one is um, quite uh, challenging and in terms of SARS-CoV-2, um, the candidate is uh, quite much. I can show you some data in the next slides. So um, the virus DNA or uh, NNA, uh, RNA is used like this. Uh, 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 and uh, it, it, as the component of the vaccines. Now, to put this DNA or RNA, uh, you need some transport. Uh, 
So DNA, you need plasmid to transport it. So plasmid is the um, DNA of the bacteria. And for RNA, because RNA is only uh, one, one helix, right? So you need some lipid coated to let this uh, mRNA uh, goes to your cell. Now, uh, for DNA RNA, RNA vaccines, currently there is no licensed vaccine yet. But this one is very easy and safe because you don't need to involve the real virus. Now, um, what they do is they injected this DNA with the plasmid and then the cells intake, uh, intake it. And uh, for DNA, it will turn to the mRNA. And then this mRNA, because they, uh, they bring this genome uh, virus, they, they will uh, ask your cells to produce some, for instance, this one is the uh, spike glycoprotein, which uh, been identified for the uh, uh, coronavirus. Um, now, there is also viral or bacterial factor. Yeah, what they do is they put this um, genetics and then uh, uh, and they need some factor. So what they use is they use the virus, the other virus, but the insert of the gene is uh, the, 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 the target of the pathogen. So which in this case is the uh, SARS-CoV-2. So for uh, viral factors in SARS-CoV-2, there are two types. So there is replicating viral factor and non-replicating viral factor. For the replicating viral factor, um, they use the um, maceless, uh, vi maceless uh, virus, but uh, the gene inserted is the corona spike genes. And then for non-replicating -replic uh, viral factor, they use adenovirus um, envelope, but they put corona spike genes inside of this um, uh, this uh, this adenovirus. And actually, uh, one of the most um, uh, the most development or the, uh, with, yes, the the best vaccines candidate vaccine for SARS-2 SARS-2 uh, coming from uh, non-replicating viral factor from Oxford now in terms of the vaccine development it actually uh, can take quite a bit of time so usually it takes 10 until 15 years so starting with the preclinical and then goes to the phase one human testing phase two need a human testing and phase three this is the last um, phase for uh, SARS-CoV-2 candidate vaccines uh, currently um, with uh, needs a larger group of human so what uh, sorry yeah now in terms of the preclinical it's um, a very beginning of vaccine development. So this thing in here, you will test this candidate of antigen of vaccines in vitro using the cell uh, cell cell culture, and in vivo. In vivo is uh, usually goes with the mice or monkey or uh, any other types of animal. Now, if this one is succeed, and then they go to the phase one, phase two phase three using a larger group I mentioned and then uh, it usually get the license after um, success in phase three human testing and then it will be licensed. So uh, in terms of the coronavirus I think they are speed up in this case uh, in this space and then now uh, uh, one vaccines the last one from Oxford uh, has been uh, in phase three uh, human testing. Now this is the, this is the update corona vaccines development all over the world. Now uh, I get this data from uh, WHO draft landscape uh, 2020 uh, June 2020. So quite uh, quite new. Currently, there are one, 129 vaccines uh, in development, uh, and this is some of the types of the vaccines, so mRNA, DNA, 
even there there are some um, group using whole whole pathogen vaccines the traditional one life attenuated and inactivated uh, some use virus like particle but most of them are using recombinant protein just like in indonesia and then of uh, all uh, above these 129 candidates uh, 13 of, of them are now in do, uh, are now in the human trial now these are some of the company who do the uh, who success uh, who are now in the human trial phase so the most succeed one is actually chat uh, ox1s this is non replicating viral vector and this one is uh, coming from Swedia, working together with the University of Oxford. Um, and also there are uh, mRNA virus um, and also virus inactivated, uh, inactivated virus and so on. So yeah, uh, China, China has one, two, three, three candidates from China and uh, most of them are now doing the phase one or phase two trials. Now um, I will discuss a little bit how uh, on on how the technology uh, of vaccines working on. So as you know that uh, the antigen or the type of the vaccine have uh, quite vary or many type of vaccine, and then in the upstream there is a uh, they need to um, let the virus reproduce in the cells. So they need cell uh, cell culture, and also like mRNA or DNA. Maybe they they just simply need a plasmid to develop this virus or DNA. Sometimes they use the um, bacteria expression system. So Merck support uh, this te vaccine technology in terms of the cell culture, as Asanga mentions. Uh, and then also for the formulation, like putting the stabilizer or the adjuvant and uh, and 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 etc. We also support it. So use Merck support all of this upstream, downstream formulation, and uh, until the end of the vaccine uh, manufacture. Uh, this is uh, just a little bit specific on how these vaccines um, generate. So identify the antigen. This is very impactful as well. So like Eggman has found the antigen for local SARS-CoV-2. And then they need to design it and characterize it. And then this antigen will go to the vaccine. So they need the... Uh, to uh, improve the immunogenicity, they need the adjuvant and uh, delivery system and uh, and other things. And then after that, they will test it. They will test the immunogenicity using some biomarkers or some mass spec or chromatography. And this one is goes to the um, research development and then um, the last one in the preclinical, uh, pre they need to see the toxicity and also some testing to see how good the vaccine candidate is and then goes to the manufacturing. All right, so uh, that's all about my talk in vaccines development. I'll get back this talk to uh, Asanga. <laughs> Uh, Sri, you need to stop sharing so that I can share. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we are coming to the uh, end of the talk, closer to the end, and then we can go into a question and answer mode. So we've, we've spoken about diagnostics, we, about vaccines, about antivirals, and I saw there's a... a quite a few interesting questions about immunity as well as uh, um, blocking of S2 protein, et cetera, that uh, we would like to discuss with you soon. Uh, but I want to spend a little bit more time here on pathogenesis because this is where we hope that uh, we can inspire more young scientists like you in Indonesia 
to take part because now for the foreseeable future, uh, basic virus research as well as applied virus research uh, is going to be more and more important. And we also see globally that there's a shift of funding into infectious disease. So hopefully this can inspire some of you to start working in these areas. Couple of things to mention as Sri spoke before. A lot more people now are involved in cell culture and cellular analysis for two reasons. Number one, to look at, look at the mechanisms of how the virus actually infects the cell and what kinds of pathogenesis is causing, as well as to look at uh, <clears throat> the antibodies and antigens that are um, generated within those cells. The second area is that a lot of people are looking at in immunology is uh, cytokine and chemokine analysis. Uh, because one of the, the key issues that uh, people are facing right now is when you get sick with this coronavirus, in some cases your body uh, has an ab abnormally high level of uh, cytokine response, also known as a cytokine storm. I'm sure many of you have heard or read about it. And this actually causes a hyperinflammation in the lung area. And unfortunately, this eventually leads to vascular leakage, where the patient has difficulty breathing and almost ends up drowning in your, in your own um, bodily fluids. So these are some of the areas that globally students and researchers are working on uh, for understanding better the details about this virus and how we can stop it. Okay. So, uh, based on this, everything that we learned, um, what are the likelihoods of pandemics happening in the future? And what we see is due to changing human behavior, that we have an increased exposure to non-human pathogens, which means that there's a higher chance of pandemics happening more often. Before, uh, and I'm sure I'm a lot older than many of the people on the call, I had never heard of pandemics and things like this growing up because they happened in 1918. But in the last uh, 10, 15 years, we've had SARS, we've had MERS, we've had H1N1, swine flu, and now uh, another round of SARS. So they seem to be happening more often. And a lot of it is coming with human uh, changes in behavior. Because of increase in uh, global middle class and wealth, we see that there's a lot of increased meat consumption. And as you saw with uh, this current pandemic, it was because of exposure to a meat market where, where they assume it first transmitted the zoonosis over from uh, <clears throat> the animal to human. Also, we see a lot more encroachment into natural areas. So people are cutting down a lot more rainforests for things like agriculture, housing, uh, plantations in Indonesia. Uh, of course, for Kalapa Savi, yeah, we see a lot of encroachment. And during this encroachment, people are now exposed to a lot more animals and pathogens that their body has not been exposed to before, increasing the likelihood of um, something transmitting over. And globally now, especially in Asia, we see an increased um, demand for exotic animal trade. In certain countries for food and for uh, natural or Ayurvedic medicine, and also for consumption. And in some cases, people are also exposed because you keep exotic pets uh, like birds or like um, reptiles. And this increases, this daily exposure to exotic animals can increase your risk of a pathogen transmitting over to, to you. Increased urbanization also is not helping. Uh, as you can see with cities like Jakarta, where more and more people migrate into the city for employment, uh, for school, for um, a better life, etc. And this increases the risk of pandemics because now you have a lot of people living in a very condensed area, so you're able to transmit the virus um, on a regular basis. Globalization, as you saw with COVID-19, the virus is able to spread very far into far corners of the world, all the way from um, California down to New Zealand and up into Russia, 
simply because the goods and, and uh, people transport is very efficient right now. And finally, there are bigger changes, uh, climatic change that expands the, the range of uh, vectors like mosquitoes. So there's a prediction that uh, diseases that we only see in the tropics now, like malaria and dengue, could spread to northern countries as well as the planet continues to warm. And then also increasing temperatures uh, are resulting in a lot more flooding. We can mobilize waterborne pathogens like cholera. And these are issues that we see in Jakarta as well on a regular basis. Now, <clears throat> as you can see here from this girl running away from many viruses and pathogens, we are constantly bombarded by these viruses, but our immunity is able to fight it on a regular basis. So zoonotic viruses will continue to enter populations. We have developed our areas to fight them. But in some cases, unfortunately, they're able to evolve and overcome barriers, <clears throat> and then it becomes a pandemic. Our best defense is surveillance, as you saw from the data we presented before, where uh, scientists are openly sharing a lot of information and collaborating in their scientific efforts, as well as um, governing bodies like WHO and ministries of health um, doing digital surveillance for hotspots and advising people how to protect themselves. So this collaborative science effort overall that we see globally is helping us as well. And then finally, this pandemic too will happen, hopefully sooner than later for all of us. There could be a periodic re-emergence of it, uh, what people are calling the second wave. And we are unclear right now as to if we are still seeing the first wave or a second wave, but there are a few hints in countries like China and Korea that were quite successful in suppressing the first wave, where we are now seeing a few more clusters rising up, but they have also been suppressed um, quite quickly uh, because we have mounted a, a very strong public health response. So, what can we do as uh, knowledgeable people to protect ourselves? And what are we doing at Merck with our employees? We are always encouraged to wear a mask. This is the best way of reducing the virus transmitting to somebody else or from you acquiring the virus from an uh, infected person. It's important to stay calm uh, and work from home. And this is one of our sales reps who is doing some experiments in uh, tissue culture in his own home. So it's a good time to practice uh, and enhance your skills and your hobbies. You heard a lot about immunology. So these are some of the medicines you can naturally consume, which is widely available in Indonesia that can help boost your immunity. As you notice here, there's nothing much uh, from the meat products because general consensus is that actually causes a little bit more inflammation in the body to your immunity. So um, you can increase your intake of uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, and uh, for people who want more information, you can definitely ask your medical doctor or nutritionist about this. Increasing your exercise also helps to boost your own immunity, and it's a good way to fight the virus. Uh, but this doesn't mean you should go to a gym following guidelines. It's better to exercise on your own in the beautiful outdoors we have here in Indonesia, uh, like you see this lady jogging on a beach. And then uh, you can also uh, exercise indoors, no matter who you are. I, I took this photo from a newscast because this is the president uh, of Uganda in Africa who's 79 years old and he made a video to show his country people how they can um, exercise at home and boost their immunity. And finally, um, here in Indonesia as well, we see that many people uh, due to uh, loss of job or inability to survive because they used to do day-to-day -day jobs uh, they are struggling economically. 
So if we have a chance, uh, we should be a good citizen and please make sure that we are helping our neighbors. Finally, uh, I want to really thank uh, I3L. Uh, this was a pleasure for us to share this information with you. And um, hopefully we have a nice discussion now in the Q&A session. Thank you very much from all of us at Merck. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Asanga, Ibu Ilma, and Ibu Sri for the very informative and also comprehensive presentations about SARS-CoV-2. Um, I have gathered here several questions from the chat. Uh, so what should we do this? Uh, should I um, read the chat and then you answer the questions? Yeah, sure, uh, Ibu Marisa, you can go ahead right. and then All right. if the so, question is pertinent to me or Ilma or Sri, I will, I will guide it along that way. Okay, so here is one question about uh, why is it that for some viruses, we can successfully mount good immune response? but not from some others. Is there any reason why is that? Uh, sorry, what was the question again? You broke up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, so there is a, a, why is it that we can mount good immune response for some viruses like measles, it is one of infections, but for, for, for some others, the immune right. response is not good, yeah. Yes, true. Now for measles, the reasons we have uh, herd immunity is we have a very good vaccine. Uh, it's called MMR and uh, you get it when you're a kid. I don't know at what age, I think it'd be under five years old. So by vaccinating the, the population over the years, we have been able to eliminate this uh, pathogen from affecting people versus uh, the RNA viruses that are heavily for example, like HIV, or in this case, the, the COVID, um, it's a bit more challenge because it's a moving target. And mm -hmm. a, a very successful vaccine for MMR, I think it took about 12 years. And again, this was developed when we did not have a lot of modern technology and not, not, not a lot of modern IT and data analysis. So we are hoping with the new technologies that we have and data sharing, uh, we are able to uh, develop a vaccine sooner. But with vaccine development, you have to be very, very careful because as Sri showed before, you are actually giving a virus to a healthy person and hoping that they mount an immune response. But that person can also get the disease. So, to really undergo a, a very thorough, um, let's say, uh, scrutiny before it comes into the population. And um, I think there was a question about uh, dengue from Andy Marga. Um, there was a vaccine developed about five years ago, anti-dengue vaccine by Sanofi. And uh, it was trialed in uh, Philippines and also Indonesia, but it was not successful. Uh, it was against the NS1 protein of the vaccine. Uh, and unfortunately, some of the patients in the trial also ended up getting a severe dengue. And the problem with dengue is because there are four serotypes, right? One, two, three, four. So if you design a vaccine against one serotype, but then the patient is infected with the second serotype, you're now giving them those. Right. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about uh, ADE. Uh, how is it likely that uh, we can avoid the ADE uh, in uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine? ADE? Antibody dependent enhancement, just like the one that occur in dengue vaccine. I mean in... I can't, hear, I can't hear the question clearly, Marisa. Oh, uh, question is about the uh, possibility or the problem of antibody dependent enhancement. Um, good morning. 
and hello can you hear i heard a lot of noise uh, i can hear you but I, I don't understand the question antibody development oh uh, antibody dependent enhancement um i think you mentioned it uh, a little bit uh, also but uh, with dengue because one antibody for one dengue will enhance the infection from another type of dengue will it be also happening for uh, coronavirus ah for covid i see thank you thank you very much i understand now. uh and the answer is we don't know because it's still too early in the um, in the cycle uh we'll have to wait till um the next cycle so to speak uh and right, right. now yesterday when i tried to look at the data um there was no uh, clear data of people getting secondary infection and then um, getting the disease again so it's it's too early to answer. right um there is also a question here about uh, the association between comorbidity like cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and the severity. Is there any explanation? Um, I think uh, that's a better question asked, answered by a medical doctor. But uh, what I can tell you from what I have learned uh, from looking at some of the research and also the internet is that when you have this metabolic syndrome, and also uh, if you're a you know, which is generally generated also from obesity. You naturally in your body have a high level of inflammation, right? So now on that inflammation, when you have a, another pathogen coming in, uh, it can actually increase the overall inflammation rates in your body where it, it goes a little bit out of control and you have this, uh, what's called cytokine storm. Your body is mounting a uh, normally high immune response because you're already at a high level of inflammation as a baseline. Right, right, right. Um, uh, there is a question about how we uh, all countries in the world secure their vaccine for the population. But maybe oh. this is uh, the question. Yeah, for vaccine distribution. Yeah, I think maybe I will. Okay, that's that's more of a question on capacity. So I think uh, what we're seeing right now, for example, is countries are collaborating. For example, in Indonesia, we are going to start two vaccine trials. Uh, what she showed you before, one is what the Chinese company, which will be collaborating with Biopharma to do the clinical trials in Indonesia and maybe the analysis also with Eichmann Institute. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, if it's successful, then there will be manufacturing for Chinese population in China and manufacturing for Indonesian population in Indonesia. The second trial is a collaboration between a, a Korean company that has also developed a vaccine and the Calbe group, uh, Calbe Bioscience, of uh, which, yeah, the company name is Genexing, and uh, those trials will kick off and then the results will be similar. So what we're seeing right now is that countries are collaborating where somebody has developed the vaccine ahead of time, they're collaborating with other countries also to do clinical trials uh, to ensure that the vaccine is able to efficiently uh, create immunity in all the different populations, even though sometimes the viral strain will be variated between the countries. And based on that, you will see simultaneous uh, global manufacturing of the virus, and hopefully that will be enough doses to uh, incubate uh, as many people as needed uh, to gain hum uh, sorry, uh, herd immunity. Okay, um, we still have one minute. Um, let me see if I have more questions. Uh, yeah, there is a question about, I think it's about viral-like particles. Um, 
I mean, it's, it's more like technical uh, questions, how to to ensure that viral-like particles will work and will not cause diseases. Probably that's the questions here. This is a challenge, but uh, I think Sri has uh, studied uh, the most on this area. I will pass that question on to her. Hello. Yes, so in terms of the virus-like particle, this one is uh, quite safety, to be honest, because uh, it's only a uh, like engineer or construct the, the the envelope of the virus so only envelope so which in this case they would like to have this envelope with this spike or as protein for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, identity but it's lack of whole genome so it's only um, envelope but there's no genome of the virus so it, it's it's safer compared to the other um, uh, candidate of vaccines if I have uh, yeah Right, right, right. Um, right. I think um, we finish on time. Uh, from the chat, I didn't see any more questions. I, we have already covered all the questions. So um, with that, I would like to thank the... Sorry, Mo Sorry? there are any more questions and also sometimes people are a little shy to ask questions. They can write it in the chat later or write to you and you can send it to us. And yes, of course. Yes. Definitely email or send them uh, any answer via WhatsApp. No problem. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Asanga. So, uh, our students, you, you heard that you can uh, still uh, post a question. You can email that to me and I will forward it to Mr. Asanga and the team. So, uh, I guess with that, uh, Again, we thank you very much, Mr. Asanga, Ibu Ilma, and Ibu Sri, for a very nice, very informative, and comprehensive presentation about this virus that caused the pandemic. Hopefully, um, we will have the vaccine in the near future. And it is true that now all eyes is on infectious diseases. Because I can see that the streaming, also the student uh, choose more infectious diseases uh, than the others. Uh, so uh, with that, I think I hope the future will be bright because uh, new generation is more interested in the infectious diseases. Okay. I believe so. Yeah. Thank you very much once again, Mr. Asanga and Ibu Ilma and Ibu Sri. Thank you, Ibu 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.